Okay, we're going to move on to aquatics right now, and I'm going to introduce uh, Keith Nislo. Um, Keith works for the U.S. Forest Service. His personal research focus is on diagenous uh, freshwater fishes of the North Atlantic Basin in the northeastern U.S. and northwestern Europe in the suite of regional stressors, including climate change, that are characteristic of these highly human-dominated dom landscapes. His goal is to link environmental variation with individual and population vital rates, and then incorporate these results into models and decisions, support tools to aid restoration, conservation, and management. In addition to his personal research, he leads the Urban and Urbanizing Landscapes Program in the Northern Research Station, um, a unit of biophysical social scientists whose goal is to provide science support for sustainable socio-ecosystems. He also serves as co-PI for the Department of Interior Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, and he'll be discussing water and aquatic ecosystems in a changing regional climate. Keith. Well, thanks, Peter, and, and thanks so much to the group and the organizers for uh, the invitation, and uh, just quickly, I really hope I'm not nearly as pompous as that paragraph indicates, so just, just put it out of your minds. Um, and so uh, I'm going to talk uh, today, uh, following up on, on great presentations by Jen and Maria and, and Tony Lin, uh, and continue this conversation about water and aquatic ecosystems, a nice, really narrow, uh, focused uh, t a topic to talk about in, in 15 minutes, uh, and, and climate. And so I want to uh, start out by acknowledging uh, my co-authors in this presentation, uh, Dr. Rick Palmer, uh, who is uh, department chair in civil engineering at, at UMass and is the university director of the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, and Ben Letcher, who is uh, the ecology section leader uh, at the USGS Conti Anadromous Fish Research Center right down the, uh, the, the road from us in Turner's Falls. So, uh, Quick roadmap of uh, what I'm going to cover today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, current and forecasted climate driven changes in, in water quantity and quality, talk about the impacts of these changes on aquatic ecosystems and habitats, and then finally end with uh, how we can use existing and novel management and conservation approaches to deal with these, these issues and these challenges. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll kick it off with, with well, how are we changing? Uh, and I want to just a brief comment about context. Uh, you know, we're a well-watered region, particularly compared to some other places in the U.S. and across the world. Uh, but just quickly to note that in this socio-ecosystem, and I use that term because both our human communities and our human infrastructure and our ecosystems really are predicated and have developed in the context of abundant and predictable water. And so changes in that aspect of their environment are going to be important no matter how much water there is. Uh, and then uh, uh, second, when I'm going over some of the observed and projected changes, I'm going to emphasize how changes in precipitation and flow regimes and changes in thermal regimes co-determine some important aspects of water quantity and quality. So, uh, again, uh, previous speakers did a great job setting the context uh, in terms of observed and projected changes. If we look at the uh, uh, panels on the left, we're talking about the, the great commonwealth of Massachusetts, and I didn't focus on Massachusetts because I knew uh, Peter Church was going to be uh, the, the moderator. Uh, I, I, I had these beforehand, but it, I'm, I'm, I'm glad it worked out. Uh, and, but they're representative for the region as a whole, and I won't go into detail. So it's, getting, it's been getting warmer. It's going to get warmer, again, depending on, on our missions. Uh, it's going to get wetter. Uh, and there's going to be uh, less precipitation in the form of rain, uh, as snow as opposed to rain. All these are, are going to be quite important. And then has been pointed out a number of times is that these changes, particularly in precipitation, are going to be uh, particularly strongly manifest with respect to extreme events. And what we have here with the panels on the left uh, is uh, some work from Ray Bradley and Li Liang Nang from uh, uh, the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center looking at uh, uh, the uh, 
intensity of rainfall in terms of millimeters of precipitation in the left-hand column and the number of days over the 90% exceedance and then going down uh, in uh, 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 worse and worse climate emission scenarios. The darker the blue, the more the increase in these two metrics of precipitations. And as you know, uh, the great blue meanie once said, it's, it's going to be a blue world uh, in the Northeast, you know, and it's and it just going get, to gonna get bluer with respect to these intense events. Uh, and a similar work by uh, Catherine Hayo and cooperators showing that, yes, indeed, it really does appear that uh, the Northeast, the upper Northeast, seems to be uh, ground zero for these changes in uh, uh, the frequency and magnitude of these precipitation extremes. So uh, what we want to talk about here is how these changes, how these climate changes are influencing uh, water and aquatic habitats. And so uh, what we've got here is a, 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 a study, a national study looking at long-term records, long-term monitoring records of stream temperature, showing that indeed, as we would predict, as air temperature has gone up, stream temperatures has, have, have also gone up. And we've got some representatives uh, here uh, from uh, New York State and from Maryland, or further south in here, that all kind of coincide with these general national trends of increasing annual stream temperatures. And here in the Northeast, uh, what we've uh, done is we've really benefited from kind of an incipient monitoring network. Essentially, a lot of folks with interests in water temperature and stream temperature going out, deploying these really easy to use uh, uh, long-term stream temperature loggers uh, in lots of different places. And you've got an indication of how many of those places there, were, there are, there are data available for uh, in, you know, across this region uh, on the left. And they were uh, the data that my uh, 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 co-author Ben Letcher, a research group, used to uh, uh, come up with uh, air temperature, stream temperature models, which then can be used to uh, both fill in gaps in terms of uh, trends and status of, of, uh, of stream temperature, but also as the platform for projecting changes. And uh, you see that illustrated on the uh, right hand uh, uh, figure. Uh, in terms of flows, uh, both the observed record, which I don't have data here, and the models are consistent with respect to increases both in annual flows, but also, as was pointed out previously, and I pointed out just again, uh, increases in uh, extreme events and peak flows. And what you have here is some modeling work by Rick Palmer and his group uh, with um, a recurrence interval on the uh, x-axis. As we know, less frequent floods or more intense floods occur less frequently, and this is a very predictable uh, attribute of these systems. And what we've got uh, illustrated here is the results of some coupled GCM and hydrologic models that uh, Rick and his group did for the Connecticut River and showing how as you increase emissions or over, as, you, as you go over time, uh, that you are increasing the frequency of a given intent of magnitude of an event or decreasing the recurrence interval of a particular event so that the flood that used to happen every 50 years is now happening every 20 to 30 years. It was predicted to happen every 20 to 30 years. And this is a, a good example of how that is manifest across the entire range of potential floods. We extend this a little bit more broadly uh, in the state of Massachusetts with these models. We can see that in, the, the, in these really intense floods, 100-year floods, uh, even within the near term, term, most of locations are predicted to see increases in frequency. And but in the longer term, 2060 to 2099, almost all locations will be experiencing increases in the magnitude of the 100-year flood. In terms of low flows, things are a little bit more complicated. A lot of our models are indicating that because of increased evapotranspiration in the uh, growing season, summer, also in the fall, that in spite of more precip, we should see more, at least short-term, low flows and potential droughts. 
And here's uh, from those same models that I showed earlier, or, uh, just now for floods, are predictions of increases in the frequency of these low flows. Uh, the problem is that we don't really see that in the observational record, in the monitoring record, as of yet. And there's some interesting interactions that are going on that are probably uh, causing some variation uh, in that relationship that might be responsible. So moving from uh, what's happening to what it means, uh, so it's warmer, wetter, more extreme and less predictable, and it's just going to get more so, uh, what does it mean for these uh, ecosystems and habitats? I want to talk a little bit uh, about what I'm terming temperature and flow dependent ecosystems and habitats as being particularly vulnerable uh, to these changes. So uh, talk about my uh, favorite set of habitats of, of mine, uh, cold water ecosystems and the, uh, the uh, species that they harbor. And one probably really effective way to define what is a, a cold water system, it's uh, a water body where in the summer it doesn't get hot enough to stress out brook trout or some similar co-occurring salmonid. And what we have here is some sort of fundamental physiological information showing that above a certain temperature, uh, right around 21 degrees C, these species start showing a really strong stress response. And that threshold for stress response is very closely associated with their distributional limit. So that is, it's a, it's a really strongly defined ecosystem type that we can look at and see what the consequences of a changing climate might be. So following along with this, uh, colleague Ben Letcher, our group, looked at uh, some predictors of uh, brook trout occupancy, where brook trout in this cold water sentinel species were likely to occur currently on the landscape, and found one of the most the strongest predictors, as you might expect, was July temperature. What these models allowed us to do uh, by changing that parameter in the model to get a sense of which particular places on the landscape, here we, uh, we're showing uh, a, a chunk of New England, are likely to be resilient to a certain level of increase in air temperature. Because we know the air temperature, stream temperature relationship, and then we know the stream temperature to brook trout occupancy relationship, we can make those forecasts. And here, uh, we've got a, a, in this, in this uh, figure, green is good, uh, yellow is vulnerable, and uh, that is, is a really a, a, a nice depiction of where resilient habitats are likely to be. A little more on that later. We wanted to pursue this work and get a sense uh, more specifically about how different land ownerships and how this might change, uh, 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 influence availability of these critical habitats. And just quickly, we can see that even now in a basin like the Connecticut River, uh, even though public lands are a small fraction of, our, uh, of, of, of the, the total land area, they make a disproportionate contribution to habitat, and that contribution is expected to increase uh, in the future. So uh, giving managers a bit of a look ahead in terms of the importance of what they're doing and where they're doing it. Similarly, uh, with respect to the overall region, in this graph what we've shown is that the northern forest region itself, states of Maine, Vermont, uh, New York, are really going to be the strongholds for this ecosystem type and are going to be sort of distribution level, uh, distribution scale uh, refugia for these kinds of systems. Moving to flow dependence, um, what we see, particularly in uh, some critical species, is a strong dependence on a high and predictable spring flood or spring flood pulse. For example, for floodplain forests, for migrating anadromous <coughs> fishes, work at Hubbard Brook and others suggest that the reliability of this spring flood driven by smooth snow melt is decreasing, and that has uh, really strong implications for how well these species can pursue their life cycles. So uh, moving quickly onto uh, uh, some more impacts, 
with respect to these fundamental aspects of, of, uh, of, of water and aquatic habitats, effects on sediments, nutrients, and materials, again, we see a disproportionate influence of extreme events. Uh, so Hurricane Irene here in Vermont actually provided us a lot of uh, uh, information to kind of explore uh, these impacts. And one of the more interesting things that me and my collaborators found is that uh, the extreme events and associated landslides with this uh, hurricane have long-term and persistent effects on both sediment regimes. So lots of sediment went in, those landslides continued to, uh, uh, to contribute sediment and large wood, and those landslides continued to the gift that keeps on giving. So that, that has in, uh, continued since then as well. We'll also see that with respect to some key aspects of critical habitat, work done by my grad student that looked at the distribution and abundance of sandbar and island habitat. And here in the White River of uh, Vermont, uh, pictured above, we see that uh, in the graph that the frequency of sandbar habitat increased following Irene, which is that dot of, of, of extreme flows that you see in the bottom graph. Okay, which suggests that we actually might be having a regime shift in terms of a sediment regime dominated by chronic processes to a sediment regime dominated by uh, uh, episodic extreme event processes. So really quickly, I'm gonna go through uh, a few management and conservation strategies and two common themes. Uh, with respect to these, uh, these strategies, I think the themes that resonate throughout them are the need to incorporate multiple dimensions and the need to look at what I'm gonna call virtuous versus vicious cycles of response to water uncertainty. And these involve both valuing established approaches, uh, approaches such as conserving and restoring forest land, restoring aquatic connectivity via barrier removals, and base cabin re restoration, and we can use those to look at how well these established strategies can be in, for example, conserving uh, brook trout habitat, making it more resilient, uh, how these barriers contribute to population resilience, uh, express this in this decision support tool to allow managers to identify where these barriers should be removed, uh, and also uh, implement changes on the landscape that can help to mitigate these extremes uh, and allow us to move our hydrographs and our flow regimes in from where they're likely to increase damage levels uh, and also by at the same time they're de decreasing these risks to human communities increase uh, habitat and natural resource value for uh, natural communities. And I'll go ahead and stop there because I'm at time. Thank you, Keith. Um, questions? Question over here. Last the one before this. Okay, sure. We have a question over here, Keith. Uh, why don't you give it a... You know, I, Keith, if you could repeat the question okay, oh, for the audience. So uh, the question, uh, if I can uh, uh, repeat it uh, and, and, and capture what you're trying to say, is uh, what about the dependent? What about species and habitats that are dependent on ice scour associated with the flooding and ice dynamics that that are that are that are that that, that drive them? And my response, I, I did some work on ice and scour and flooding way back when, and it's really hard. It's, you know, it's, it's because you've got, all at the same time, you've got hydraulic changes, 
You've got, uh, you've got phase changes from water, liquid water to ice, uh, all happening at the same time. Very difficult to see, to, to kind of forecast how that might be manifest in a climate change future. One could make the argument that because we're going to get a lot more rain on snow events and rain potentially on ice events, depending on how that works out, we could actually see more ice jam floods because we're seeing a more dynamic winter. Uh, so, but you know, it may never get warm enough to make enough ice to make enough difference. So that, that's a, a real challenge, but one that monitoring could really could help to, 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 to look at. All right. 